Peace to Network show. Hope everybody's doing well today. Happy New Year to everybody. It is Saturday, January 14th, 2023. And I wanted to um, do this presentation. I wanted to do it last year, but didn't get a chance to do it. And um, I wanted to do I wanted to do it uh, January 1st, but could not because I was speaking at a Kwanzaa event. So this deals with what's behind the tradition of African-Americans eating um, black eyed peas on New Year's Day. Many of us know this. We have family that comes from the South, and this is a tradition in many African-American families. But there's a deep, rich history behind this. And also, this ties into uh, the history of the transatlantic slave trade as well and uh, other foods that we eat also because there are American foods that there are foods that we think uh, are American foods but they're actually African foods, okay? And this gets into a, a deep history. So we're gonna talk about this uh, today. So everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms, invite your friends to tune in also. Uh, and then also we'll give you information about my online class, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school because our Sunday, uh, January 15th class, uh, it's going to be a free class session, so you'll all be able to join that at, at, at our school, but we'll give you some information about that also. So I've been reading, I've, I've read a number of different articles dealing with this topic uh, over the past few years. And um, the past this past week, I went through and reread a lot of the information that I have on this, right? So... Uh, there's a good article from the Columbus Dispatch, the Columbus Dispatch called uh, Black Eyed Peas uh, Reach Deep Into Tradition. Black Eyed Peas Reach Deep Into uh, Tradition. And uh, this article is from uh, December 24th, 2019, December 24th, 2019, by Bridget Washington for uh, the New York Times. And if we look at this article here, we see that um, it, they talk about uh, a woman named Mashama Bailey, Mashama Bailey, uh, who, who asked and, and asked, uh, Mashama is a chef. She asked her maternal grandmother, Neva West of Forsyth, uh, Georgia, to serve these with ham hocks and collard greens on New Year's Eve. Now, Michelle Bailey was returning to New York City where she uh, where she lived and wanted uh, to have that symbolic meal before she left that day. Now, uh, 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 Mashama said, I felt loved when she decided to make that dish uh, early for me. And uh, Mama Bailey is a chef at the Gray in Savannah, Georgia. She said she had a special way of making all her grands, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, children feel loved by her. Now, the first big meal of the new year uh, with the pot of black-eyed peas at its center is deeply entwined with African-American culture, deeply entwined with African-American, okay, and we're blowing up the size here of uh, the print, so you should be able to see see this now uh jessica b harris and I, I read some different articles where jessica b harris is quoted she is a food historian there's an article from the national geographic that i'm going to share with you that deals with how different african foods made their way to america and jessica b harris is uh quoted in, in, in that article as well all right so uh jessica b harris said eating black eyed peas on New Year's Day has been done by Black Americans to ensure uh, good luck in the incoming year. And uh, Jessica B. Harris uh, finally recalled attending uh, the lively New Year's uh, Day party that uh, Maya Angelou uh, held at her home in Harlem where Black Eyed Peas were served. Now, Jessica B. Harris said this tradition carries over uh, 
from the black from from, from the from the African American community or the black American community into the general southern community in many places and persists in the north as well as a result of the great migration. So what we're going to see is we're going to we, we, we see the impact of two migrations. One forced th during the transatlantic slave trade and one partially voluntary uh partially forced as well through the great migration and if you if you understand the history of uh the great migration and uh, about six million african americans migrating from the south up north and out west okay from 1915 to uh from 1915 to uh 19 uh 1970 from 1915 to 1970 if you understand the history of the great migration then we know some of it was voluntary but some was forced some of us were ran out of the south by domestic terrorists by the ku klux klan things like this some of us are having our land stolen uh our plant our, our farm land stolen things like this and then also in the late 1800s going into the early 1900s you have what's known as the bow weevil attack on cotton crops in the south the bow weevil was eating up cotton crops destroying cotton crops so a lot of us left the south because of that uh as well and we took these traditions with us into the north okay so you you have the forced migration of uh the transatlantic slave trade uh but then also we have the uh great migration of 19 uh, 1915 through 1970 okay so th this is gonna and, and the great migration is going to change uh totally change the history of this country uh and then when we look at the transatlantic slave trade also we see african foods are coming to the u.s and then the way that africans seasoned the food also the way africans seasoned the food we're seasoning it oftentimes in a way based upon how we season food in Africa and this reminding of us of home, but it's changing the taste buds of white people in the South as well. And then when you look at what's known as Southern comfort food or heritage food coming from the South, a lot of times it gets attributed to white uh, chefs like Paula Dean or is looked at as something that white people created. But a lot of that, you're dealing with foods coming from Africa and the way the food is prepared, the way it's seasoned is influenced by African people also. Okay, let's continue. How's everybody doing today? All right, so the tradition uh, carries over from, uh, the, from the African American community into the general Southern community in many ways and persists in the north as well as a result of the great migration now black eyed peas were domesticated uh black eyed peas were domesticated in west africa and carried to the south and the caribbean in the era of slavery said food historian jessica b harris dried legumes will look down or beans dried legumes will look down on as poor man's food but the economic scarcities of the civil war which is 1861 to 1865 severely impacted the diets of both enslaved africans and white southerners severely impacted the diets of both enslaved africans and white southerners black eyed peas became more common uh, and it is said people considered themselves fortunate to eat them during a time rife with food insecurity. So when we look at the uh, U.S. Civil War, right, 1861, 1865, Civil War is going to uh, largely destroy the South, not 100 percent, but largely destroy the South. Plantations are burned, bridges knocked out, roads knocked out, things of this nature. And you're going to have a lot of destitute white people okay uh because because uh, uh, of the civil war uh 3.9 million enslaved african people largely basically are going to be freed 
uh, and then they're legally freed. Uh, the U.S. Constitution is amendment December amended December 6, 1865, because of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, when Georgia ratifies the 13th Amendment. So you're going to have what's called the Freedmen's Bureau of um, the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees and Abandoned Lands. OK, which is created in 1865 by Act of Congress, March 1865, the Freedmen's Bureau. And the Freedmen's Bureau is providing assistance to newly freed slaves, is helping them negotiate labor contracts, is, is helping build schools and helping them with food, things like this, uh, is helping them find lost loved ones who were sold off uh, from, uh, you know, from plantations, various plantations, and uh, is helping them reunite. But the Freedmen's Bureau is also helping poor, destitute white people as well, those who may have been uh, worked on farms, those who may have even owned small farms or what have you. In the um, miniseries Roots, the original Roots, 1977 uh, on ABC, the miniseries Roots, there was a, um, when they dealt with the period of the uh, Civil War and afterwards, there was a uh, uh, a poor a poor white guy who, who was named Old George, Old George. And um, he had a wife who was pregnant and the uh, the former slaves bring them into the house and, and feed them. OK, so we, we see some of this depicted in uh, the miniseries Roots. OK, uh, let's go back to this also. Now, now, the class that I teach on Tuesdays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, we get into uh a lot of this type of information here dealing with the Civil War and the Reconstruction era. Uh, you can check out that information, register for it at our website, the African History Network.com, the African History Network.com. You can scroll down the page. Uh, my main class that I teach is uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. This time around, it's a 16 week online course. Normally, it's on Saturdays, but we're doing a special session on Sunday, January 15th, 2023, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And it's going to be a free session. So everybody watch it right now. Go to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, or we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast. Click on this link here. You can register for the free session, okay? And even after the course is over with, uh, or even after the session is over with, you'll still have access to it. You can still go back and watch the free session as much as you want to. And you can register for the full course which is on sale $60, regularly $130. All right, let's continue. Um, so dried legumes were looked down on as poor man's food, but economic scarcities, uh, but the economic scarcities of the Civil War severely impacted the diets of both enslaved Africans and white Southerners. Now, black eyed peas became more, uh, more common uh, and it is said people considered themselves fortunate to eat them during a time rife with food insecurity. Though uh, Mashama Bailey's family uses ham hocks instead of uh, uses ham hocks in his black eyed peas, that that's probably something that is a holdover from slavery eating ham hocks, because uh, to my knowledge, uh, historically in Africa, we didn't eat ham hocks or generally speaking we didn't eat pigs generally speaking so that's probably a holdover from slavery when i eat black eyed peas i'm a vegetarian i've been a vegetarian going on 17 years so i don't have ham hocks in it or chitlins or it, i don't have i don't even have turkey uh <laughs> i don't even have turkey uh, in my black eyed peas okay all right so uh, it allows, so she opts for a vegan approach that produces a clean, pure, uh, pure pea flavor, P-E-A, okay? Uh, though her family uses ham hocks in this black eyed peas, Mashama Bailey opts for a vegan approach that produces a clean, pure pea flavor. It also allows her version to be enjoyed by those who don't eat meat. So I eat black eyed peas like the day before uh, New Year's Day, like one or two days before New Year's Day, I had black eyed peas and they were veggie. They didn't have any meat in them. Uh, Mashama Bailey hopes to get 
uh, people thinking and talking about the origins and complexities of a shared heritage, the origins and complexities of a shared heritage. Black Eyed Peas are a way to achieve that goal because there's history behind the Black Eyed Peas. There's history and culture which ties us to hundreds of years of history, which goes back thousands of years also, okay? So when we look at uh, the importance of history and culture, this binds a people together. This connects people to their roots, connects them to their ancestors, connects them to languages, land, traditions, culture, history, etc. So we can learn a lot about our history just by studying uh, the foods that we eat and also how those foods are prepared. What geographic area do these foods come from? What geographic area in the world do these foods come from? OK. And then as you have a uh, as groups of people intermix with other groups of people, as groups of people meet other groups of people, whether it's voluntary or whether it's forced, you have an exchange of cultures. You have an exchange of foods that leave a lasting effect on history and on those people. All right, let's continue. Okay, so we got Stephen watching and gotten just a few of the people watching. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the work, doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting as well as broadcasting our Sunday night show, the African History Network show, uh, which we broadcast here on social media and on that 10 AM here in Detroit. Um, uh, Mashama Bailey went on to say, for me, there's more to New Year's than the tradition. For me, there's more to New Year's than the tradition. I strive to create a broader reach through a broader table. OK, so this is a, a, a good article here. And then uh, they go on to list a, um, uh, a recipe. OK that uh, you can try at home yourself as well. All right, so check out this article here from the Columbus Dispatch. Black Eyed Peas reach deep into tradition. Black Eyed Peas reach deep, in tr deep, reach deep into tradition. Now, there was another uh, article that I read. Uh, this one was from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, really good one from the Atlanta uh, Journal-Constitution. And I just got a subscription to the Atlanta Journal Constitution today, a digital subscription, because you had to get a digital subscription to be able to read this article because a paywall came up. All right. So I have a, a bunch of subscriptions I have to pay for to be able to access a lot of this information. Um, so if we look at this next article here, this is why we eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day. This is why we eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day. This is from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. OK, and this article was originally from 2019, like December 2019. It was updated uh, December 3rd, uh, 2022. This piece is from uh, Stephanie Toon, T-O-O-N-E for the Atlanta Journal uh, Constitution. All right. So uh, in this article, it, it talks about how um, New Year's Eve may traditionally include a glass of champagne um, or a kiss with a special someone, but come New Year's Day, the traditions all encompass who's on the menu. And I remember gr growing up, you know, my mom used to cook, uh, my mom's family's from uh, Tennessee, so she used to cook uh, black eyed peas on uh, New Year's Day. So we would always have black eyed peas on New Year's Day. Uh, many celebrating the new year might just be going along with uh, the other well, go, going along with the offered dishes without the context. Now, a few culinary experts have some clues how uh, regarding how this tradition came to be. According to celebrated Southern food uh, researcher John Egerton uh, in his book, Southern food at home on the road in history, Southern food 
at home on the road in history. Uh, Black Eyed Peas are associated with a mystical and mythical power to bring good luck. Black Eyed Peas are, a so, uh, are associated with a mythical and mystical power to bring uh, good luck. Now, according to a report by Southern Living, the Black Eyed Peas have that lucky reputation reaching all the way back to 500 AD as part of the Jewish holiday Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. OK, so among amongst uh, the Jewish community, this goes back to 500 AD, 500 common era AD. OK. And black eyed peas have a lucky reputation among uh, them as well. OK, but we see it going back also uh, hundreds of years, black, black eyed peas or what are known as cow peas being eaten in uh, and being used in West Africa. Now, Linda Palacio, who hosts a culinary, who hosts the culinary radio show, A Taste of the Past told the USA Today that peas and other lentils are associated with the holiday, with New Year's Day. Eating them along with collard greens, with the green color, collard greens have the green color, color represent a financially prosperous New Year. So eating uh, black-eyed peas along with collard greens represent a financially prosperous new year and collard greens and researching this because they're green they get associated with money with money and some people talk about how folded collard greens also resemble folded money dollar bills it's all about the benjamins right now though its roots do not stem from the south uh according to um uh, linda palacio Though its roots do not stem from the South, eating black eyed peas in particular dishes has become a Southern tradition. OK, now Linda, uh, Linda Palacio said now black eyed peas are served with rice in the traditional Southern U.S. dish called Hop and John. Hop and John, H-O-P-P-I-N apostrophe Hop, Hop and John for New Year's Day. So Hop and John is a Southern dish where you serve black eyed peas with rice. Now, I had seen black eyed peas with rice before, you know, reading this article in 2019 and 2020, but I I was not familiar with the term or the name Hoppin' John, okay? I didn't know anything about that. Now, or the peas can be part of a soup. Now, in Italy, the, 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 the European country, Italy, lentils mixed with pork for a lucky dish okay now that tradition of eating the peas the black eyed peas with rice is of african origin okay that tradition of eating the black eyed peas with rice is of african origin and it and it became popular in the south later especially in the carolinas and we know the carolinas North Carolina and South Carolina had a uh, large African population. And also the Carolina, especially South Carolina, was known during slavery for producing rice also. OK, and it's going to be enslaved Africans that were enslaved Africans were uh, though, especially those coming from Africa. We, we had skills in agriculture. And we knew how to plant and you know cultivate rice many of them now black eyed peas with cornbread represents gold according to uh the book southern living all right now or, or, in the report by southern living so go so cornbread has a golden color to it so that gets associated with gold now stew your if you stew your black eyed peas with tomatoes and they will become a symbol of wealth and health, okay, according to tradition. Now, one unusual but common New Year's Day Black Eyed Peas tradition involves putting actual money 
in the dish. Now, I, I had never heard of this to my knowledge. I never heard of um, anything like this, but this is a tradition uh, as well. Okay. So uh, some, some people add to their luck by cooking their pot of black eyed peas with a penny or dime inside of it. Okay. Now I don't suggest that, uh, have 911 on standby. I don't suggest you do that. It's too easy to accidentally ingest the penny or dime. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> All right. Whoever gets the bowl with the coin in it, according to legend has the best luck for the year. If you end up in emergency, um, Maybe your luck will get better that year, but <laughs> it's not going to start out too well. Okay. Plus, you know, you can choke on a penny or a dime. So uh, I don't, don't, don't try that at home. All right. Now, uh, so they, so they also have some recipes here for New Year's Day uh, recipes and dishes. Uh, you can check this out. This is uh, by Stephanie Toon for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Okay. Uh, this is why we eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day. Now, there was a uh, article that was referenced in here from USA Today. OK, this uh, article here where they quoted Linda Palacio. There was this piece here from USA Today. Uh, Linda Palacio, who hosts culinary, hosts the culinary radio show, A Taste of the Past, told USA Today that black eyed peas and other lentils are associated with the holiday. OK, so the article that they cited from USA Today is called Eating for Luck on New Year's. Why foods from grapes to peas promise prosperity, eating for luck on new years why foods from grapes to peas promise pro prosperity now i wasn't really familiar with um eating grapes now this article is from december 30th 2019 by carly malenbaum for usa today and i read this article when it came out in 2019 uh i wasn't familiar with eating grapes OK, I do like grapes, but I wasn't familiar with that for New Year's Day. OK, but if we look here uh, at the article, uh, it talks about how some foods are just plain lucky to eat. What associates these dishes with good fortune? Uh, exactly. That's tough to pinpoint. But much of the answer has to do with symbolism and superstition, superstition. Much of the answer has to do with symbolism and superstition. OK, now it also has to do with a human tradition of eating something special like a birthday cake to mark the passage of time. So what will people be biting into at the top of 2020 or 2023 uh, to set them up for success? So they talk to food historians. Uh, Megan Elias, uh, food writer and director of the gastronomy, uh, uh, gastronomy program at Boston University, Boston University, Linda Palacio, uh, who we just cited, who hosts the culinary uh, radio show, A Taste of the Past. They talked to them about some of the lucky foods you'll find on global New Year's menus. So 12 grapes. OK, that's a tradition. Wasn't familiar with that. Now, this was a ritual started in Spain around um, 1900 Common Era A.D. Twelve grapes, as the tradition goes. Believers eat 12 grapes at midnight, one for each month of the year, one for each month of the year. According to one story, the ritual started in Spain around 1900. When a grape grower had a bumper crop, it means a good crop, a bumper crop, says Linda Palacio, and was creative about giving away the surplus. But that history is fuzzy at best, she says. 
Now, regardless, stuffing a dozen grapes into one's mouth is a tradition uh, that has spread uh, that has spread to citizens of many Latin American countries. Uh, Megan Elias, food writer Megan Elias, uh, says people annually eat grapes as fast as physically possible without puking. OK, so have fun with that one. Um, OK, I won't be trying that. Then we have peas and lentils. OK, so we have all different types of peas and lentils here. Uh, round foods resemble coins and money, said Linda Palacio. OK, so eat these uh, symbolic foods. Many people believe you eat them for financially for a financially successful year. On the contrary, don't eat the round foods and you could have a year of bad luck. Now, when we look at uh, collard greens and cornbread, if you eat peas with collard greens and cornbread, then that's even more auspicious. What? Uh, so you have the green uh, color, which is the color of money and corn and cornbread, uh, which reminds you of gold. OK, because it's yellow it is yellow in color. Now, black eyed peas are served with rice in the traditional. Southern U.S. dish called Hoppin John. OK, black eyed peas and rice for New Year's Eve for New Year's Eve. Or the peas can be part of a soup in Italy, lentils mixed with pork for a lucky dish. So then we also have uh, pork as well. I don't eat pork. I don't eat meat. I don't eat any type of animals. Um, so you can do that if you want to. You have the tradition of eating noodles also. Uh, noodles are long and that length is thought to symbolize long life. And yes, luck. OK, Megan Elias said uh, in Japan, soba noodles are served on New Year's, New Year's Day in China during the Chinese New Year or the Lunar New Year, which falls on January 25th uh in uh 2021 it would fall on january 25th people inhale uh so-called longevity noodles um okay as well so 2020 the following year 2020 okay um january 25th 2020 all right so read the rest of this article here from usa today this is one cited in the uh piece from the atlanta journal constitution eating for luck on new year's why foods from grapes to peas promise prosperity this is from uh usa today okay now there was a um uh, another piece that i read a, a good article from the national geographic all right and everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms be sure to uh follow us here on uh facebook the african history network on facebook on youtube michael m hotep i m h o t e p uh, and then also you can uh, support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also, you can follow us on uh, my other uh, fan page on Facebook, the Michael M. Hotep Show, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, the Michael M. Hotep Show. All right. Now, there was a, uh, a, a really good article that I read dealing uh, from National Geographic, dealing with African foods you thought were American, African foods you thought were American, okay? And this ties into, uh, a lot of this ties in also to the online class that I teach uh, on Saturdays, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, because we deal with thousands of years of history and various aspects of history um, in this class, okay? So, if we look at this piece right here from uh, National Geographic, five African foods you thought were American, okay? It's likely that something you ate or drank today was brought to North America by African slaves. It's likely that something you ate or drank today was first brought to North America by African slaves. Now, this is written by Catherine Zuckerman for National Geographic, September 21st, 2016. And in the article, uh, she 
starts out talking about the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And she says, food like music and literature can be a powerful portal through which to view a culture or a period in time, through which to view a culture or a period in time. Now, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, which opened in uh, uh, Washington D.C. in um, I guess that was it. That was uh, in 2017. Yeah, in September 2017. Nearly 37,000 objects will go on display in collections that range from clothing and communities to segregation and slavery, stitching together a tapestry. Of suffering, triumph, of suffering, triumph, and tradition. Now, some of these artifacts, like an oyster basket used by African American oystermen, and a large stock pot that was once used for cooking collard greens at uh, Washington, Washington D.C.'s famed Florida Avenue Grill, will be part of an exhibit that looks at African American foodways across three distinct regions, African-American foodways across three distinct regions, the agricultural South, the Creole coast and the North, especially dealing with the, the great migration from the South to the North. Now the museum's restaurant, which is called Sweet Home Cafe, will focus on ingredients and dishes, will focus on ingredients and dishes specific to these regions okay these three regions the uh, agricultural south the creole coast and the north plus one more region called the western range because african americans are going to go out west also and you're going to you know about a third of the cowboys in the old west about a third of them were african-american all right and the term cowboy was originally a derogatory term for for uh, black cattlemen or cowhands, because white men were called cattlemen or cowhands, and the black ones were called boy, cowboys. Okay, but over time, this becomes just a general term, all right, and it's applied to uh, any race. Okay, so plus one more region called the Western Range, which uh, with a uh, with offerings like shrimp and grits uh, Creole in the Creole coast, buttermilk, fried chicken, agricultural south, oyster pan roast in the north, and son of a gun stew in the western range. Now, Jerome Grant is an executive chef at uh, Sweet Home uh, Cafe. And he said each of the four regional stations demonstrate the migration of African Americans uh, and culture through foodways. Each of the four uh, regional stations demonstrate the migration of African American people and culture through foodways. So many of the fruits, vegetables, legumes or, or, or beans, that we now take for granted came to the United States from Africa through the transatlantic slave trade. So a lot of people don't know this. Among the most uh, important of these, says American foodways author and, and uh, food historian, Jessica B. Harris, whose research helped shape the Sweet Home Cafe menu at the Smithsonian uh, Museum of African American History, National Museum of African American History. Um, among the most important of these are black eyed peas, okra, watermelon, cola nuts, and coffee. Black eyed peas, okra, watermelon, cola nuts, and coffee. Now, there is a, in this article from National Geographic, they had a graphic here, they had a map. But the map doesn't populate correctly. It's something, it's it's something wrong with the way they have it encoded or something. Um, so I found it in a different source. Okay, so if we look at this PDF here, 
This is, let me flip over. Where is that? Uh, backyard. Okay, right here. Backyard Discovery. That's what I want. Backyard Discovery, Forgotten Foodways. Okay, this is from um, yeah, just Google that. Backward, backyard Discovery, Forgotten Foodways. This is from the Grove Museum. So if we scroll down here uh, to the second page, African Food Routes to North America. African food routes to North America. So this shows where these foods that we eat in North America originally came from. Before they became staples in North America, many African foods made their way over via the transatlantic slave route between the 16th and 19th centuries with coffee taking the most circuitous route with coffee taking the most circuitous route because we know uh, coffee uh, comes from Ethiopia. Okay, so if we look at this, it's a little faint, but hopefully you can see it. Uh, they have a legend here on my left, black eyed peas, coffee, cola nuts, okra, watermelons. Then they show coffee trade route, slave trade route. Okay, and then we see um okay coffee is uh, has the pattern of um uh, has the lines the pattern of the line so we see ethiopia and we see coffee here uh in ethiopia okay we see in egypt uh watermelons okay coming from egypt there's a article that deals with how watermelons date back to about five thousand uh years ago in um in egypt the watermelons uh, and then we see let's see nigeria ghana uh, west africa sierra leone uh we see in that area cola nuts okay we see cola nuts and, and they're making their way to um uh, the united states to the east coast in the united states as well as to the caribbean we see uh down here this is also in Southern Africa. This, okay, this, this is watermelons uh, in Southern Africa. And also, was that cola nuts? Okay. Then we have okra. Okay, okra is on here somewhere too. But you can take a look at this and you can see um, the trade routes and all this ended up in the Caribbean and in the United States going to the East Coast. Watermelons, okra, cola nuts, coffee, black eyed peas. All right, so check that out. African food routes to North America. Okay, now. I want to go back to the article here from uh, National Geographic. Five African foods you thought were American. Five African foods you thought were American. So if we look at, uh, we go back and look at this article here. So UCLA professor of geography, Judith Carney, uh, agrees with uh, Jessica B. Harris that uh Many of the fruits, vegetables, and legumes we now take for granted come to the United States from Africa through uh, transatlantic slave trade. Among them, um, we have um, black eyed peas, okra, watermelon, cola nuts, and coffee. UCLA professor of geography Judith Carney agrees in her book um, titled In the Shadow of Slavery Africa's Bo uh, Botanical Legacy in the atlantic botanical like botany and dealing with flowers things like this in her book in the shadow of slavery africa's botanical legacy in the atlantic world uh professor judith carney 
outlines the origins and trajectories of each of Africa's major native crops that were brought over to the U.S. on slave ships, that were brought over to the U.S. on slave ships. She said, uh, Professor Jessica Carney said, or Judith Carney, I should say, said, quote, the story of African crops is little known and poorly understood. To look at these plants is to engage the organization of the slave trade as corridors, as corridors for the diffusion of African plants to the Americas. Okay. For to look at these plants is to engage the organization of the slave trade as corridors for the diffusion of African plants to the Americas, end quote. After all, how often do we consider when selecting the ripest melon for our summer salad or ordering a, a, a cafe latte with breakfast that these things originated and flourished on a completely different continent? Even more important, how often do we consider that it was an enslaved population enslaved African population that brought them here. So then they talk about um, the Southern chefs and heritage food and Southern comfort food, things like this, and white people, white chefs. It doesn't help that white Southern chefs often receive credit for showcasing certain quote unquote heritage foods on their menus without noting that they that they're actually native to africa so it, it, you know this is something that i deal with in in um, my online classes um like ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school not only was uh not only were african people taken out of africa not only were human beings taken out of africa and not only was our labor exploited but also foods are taken out of africa as well and that's that's something that's talked about to a much lesser extent okay foods were taken out of africa uh also okay and and those foods influence our diets today. But Africa doesn't get credit for a lot of this. All right, let's continue. Uh, so it doesn't help that white Southern chefs often credit, often get, often receive credit for show, showcasing uh, certain heritage foods on their menus without noting that they're actually native to Africa. A particularly low point was when Paula Dean, a white chef from Albany, Georgia, built an empire around her brand of Southern cooking. She had books and the TV show, all that stuff. Restaurants, if I remember correctly, she had restaurants as well. But she built this brand around Southern cooking and then made headlines in 2013 for admitting using, re, using racial slurs referring to African-Americans. So you have things like this that happen and, and, you know, white people become millionaires and things like this off of Southern comfort food. But a lot of those foods come from Africa and the way you're cooking them were also influenced by African people because the way we seasoned food, like the way we season chicken and things like this, we're using, we're seasoning food uh, in many ways, how we season it in Africa, or we're using spices that come from Africa also. Because we're, there's information that deals with how we're trying to on the plantations, we're trying to recreate things that remind us of Africa, remind us of home. And one of those has to do with the way we prepare food. Now, the African American Museum aims aims to change that by uh, aims to change that by helping all Americans see how their stories 
their histories and their cultures are shaped and informed by global influences, according to uh, the museum's website. Now, so here's some more information on the uh, African origins of some popular American food. So we look at cola nuts that I talked about a few minutes ago that come from uh, West Africa. Uh, two, now Judith Carney, uh, Professor Judith, Judith Carney said, two of the most widely consumed beverages in the world today are based wholly or in part on plants ancient Africans domesticated. One of these plants is the cola nut, the cola nut, okay, whose, quote, level of caffeine considerably exceeds that of coffee and, and was once a key ingredient in Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. It's been around over 100 years, Coca-Cola. Now, African slaves used the cola nut to freshen the fetid water available on the slave ships on their voyages across the Atlantic, which undoubtedly contributed to the uh, early presence of the cola nut in the New World plantation societies, uh, Judith Carney says. Then we have okra. Now, I don't like okra. A lot of people do. Okra is kind of slimy to me. I'm not an okra fan. Um, okra comes from West Africa as well. Wherever okra points its green tip, Africa has been. Wherever okra points its green tip, Africa has been, writes uh, Professor Jessica, uh, I mean, food historian Jessica B. Harris uh, in this essay on the slender spear-shaped pod. Uh, Jessica Harris said, quote, in the South, where enslavement lasted longer and climate made Africans and their descendants most at home, it is revered and okra is revered and treated with respect. Now it's, uh, so the climate may have made Africans from Africa at home, but the conditions did not because the, the, the conditions of slavery in the South, generally speaking, generally speaking, were, were harsher than the conditions in the north. The, the size of the plantations was usually larger uh, uh, in the south, and the south was more dependent upon um, slavery for its economy, for its way of life. Even though the north did benefit from slavery, even after most of the northern states abolished slavery, they, you know, you had uh, banks, up north, like in uh, New York, you had cotton mills um, in New York and New England, et cetera. So the North still financially benefited from slavery, even after they abolished slavery. But um, their economy was not as dependent upon slavery as the South's economy was. And also the climate in the south was more, more conducive to growing crops also all right let's continue so in the south where enslavement lasted longer and climate made more africans and their descendants most at home it is it is revered okra is revered and treated with respect it's an ingredient in the southern succotashes of many states and reign supreme in many of the gumbos, reign supreme in many of the gumbos of New Orleans and Southern Louisiana. Now, Southerners just seem to know, or perhaps have learned from African Americans, how to savor the slippery juice that the tender pods exude when they are cut. So then we have watermelon, okay? And watermelon, uh, comes uh, originally comes from Africa as well. The exact region that it originates from is not exactly known. Okay. But um, the ancestor of the watermelon we know today first grew in Africa, but its prototype 
its prototype was originally a bitter melon that was grown on arid savannas for its edible seeds and as a storable form of moisture, said uh, Professor Judith uh, Carney. OK, now there's an article that I'm going to go to in just a minute here from uh, National Geographic called the 5000 year secret history of watermelon, the 5000 year secret history of watermelon. Now, scholars debate where exactly on the uh, continent watermelon came from, but it was cultivated widely in ancient Egypt, where it was buried in Pharaoh's tombs and the Subetis tombs to provide hydration for their journeys to the afterlife. So then we have uh, black eyed peas also. OK. And black eyed peas, we know, um, we see it come from the, the black eyed peas are also called cow peas, and we know they come from Central and Southern Africa, all right? But they also come from West Africa as well. So black eyed peas are high in protein with leaves that are rich in minerals. Black eyed peas grow quickly. They suppress weeds and uh, improve yields of crop. They suppress weeds and, and uh, improve yields of other crops. The legumes were used as a provision on slave ships and later also used to feed livestock, okay? And later also used to feed livestock in the U.S. This is where the alternate name cow pea comes from, okay? Because they were used to feed cows. Now, black eyed peas are associated now with New Year's Day in the American South and are a key ingredient in Hoppin' John, uh, a dish made with greens and pork that symbolizes good luck. And you make Hoppin' John with uh, rice and black eyed peas. So we also have coffee, okay? Coffee, which comes from Ethiopia. And uh, a few minutes ago, I showed you the map of where uh these different uh dishes come from okay or these different foods come from all right so when we look at coffee and let me flip back over to this here uh many people associate coffee with south america but ethiopia uh, is the birthplace of the world's premier coffee, writes uh, Professor uh, Judith Carney. Legend has it that a goat herder named Kalbi, K-A-L-B-I, discovered it when his herd became uh, particularly boisterous after eating berries, berries from a tree. Whether that's true or not, uh, quote, how to take a coffee bean, know when and how to roast it and turn it into a delicious beverage involved a deep cultural knowledge system of growing and brewing varieties from the Ethiopian highlands where it originated. Now, when Europeans reached East Africa, Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates in the 16th century of the 1500s, they encountered coffee houses and culture around coffee around the drink coffee but given the racial prejudice against africans uh honed during the transatlantic slave trade and the fact that coffee had become so central to muslim culture europeans attributed the art of making coffee the drink and the profusion of coffee houses this became attributed to Muslim societies. Okay, but coffee goes back to Ethiopia. Now, Judith Carney says in her book, uh, quote, the popular image, uh, the popular image of Africa, to, of Africa today is of a hungry continent. Yet it is because of African crops and African slaves, agricultural practices that we eat what and how we do today, okay? It's because of uh, African crops 
and of these African slaves agricultural practices that we eat what and how we do today. OK, so as with so many other uh, origin of food stories, uh, this food story dealing with uh, uh, coffee is complicated as well. So check out this article here from uh, National Geographic, five African foods you thought were American, five African foods you thought were American. Now, there was a uh, another article from National Geographic that deals with uh, the 5,000-year-old secret history of watermelon. The 5,000-year-old secret history of watermelon. And watermelon, uh, people of different races and ethnicities like watermelon, but historically in this country, watermelon became negatively associated with uh african americans okay and it became a uh, a racist stereotype uh there was a song by a man named uh harry c brown uh recorded in 1916 for uh columbia records and the name of that song is n-word level watermelon ha 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 inward level watermelon ha 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 the song is on um it's on youtube okay they show it and they show the um um the record the the, the columbia record they, sh they show the record all that and the song is to the uh it's a irish drinking tune called turkey and the straw okay turkey and the straw and that tune is a popular tune that is um, uh, still played by ice cream, still played by ice cream trucks to this day. There was an article from um, National Public Radio. There was an article from National Public Radio that uh, deals with this, and and let me see here. Let me pull up something here. There's an article that goes with the uh, or two articles. One deals with why watermelon became a weight racist trope. That was from the Atlantic.com. Okay, from 2014. Um, a segment on the African History Network show probably back in about 2014 when this came out uh, dealing with this story. So this one, this one right here from The Atlantic. Let me pull this up. How watermelons became racist trope. How watermelons became a racist trope. Before its subversion in the Jim Crow era, the fruit symbolized black self-sufficiency. The reason why is because, um, so this is uh, Raymond, yeah, Raymond uh, A. Brown. I think it's Raymond C. Brown, but Raymond A. Brown. Uh, words by music. But he's the one that recorded N-word level watermelon, ha, ha, ha. The watermelon was a crop that enslaved Africans were able to grow on some plantations and sell it and make money. Okay. And then it became, uh, after slavery ends, that becomes a crop that we grow also. Okay. Um, the stereotype that African Americans are, are excessively fond of watermelon emerged from a specific historical for a specific historical reason and served a, specific political purpose okay the the stereotype that african americans are excessively fond of watermelon emerged for a specific historical reason and served a specific political purpose the trope 
came in full force when African slaves won their emancipation during the Civil War, okay, or at the conclusion of the Civil War and with the 13th Amendment, free African Americans grew, ate, and sold watermelons, and in doing so, made the fruit a symbol of their freedom. Southern whites, threatened by African Americans' newfound freedom, responded by making the fruit a symbol of black people's perceived uncleanliness, uncleanly, uncleanliness, laziness, childishness, and unwanted public presence. This racist trope then exploded in American popular culture, becoming so pervasive that its historical origin became obscure. Few Americans in 1900, the, the year 1900, would have guessed the stereotype was less than half a century old. Now that the raw material for the racist watermelon trope did not exist, not, not that the, the raw material for the racist watermelon trope did not exist before emancipation, in the early modern European imagination, the typical watermelon eater was an Italian or Arab peasant. The watermelon, noted a British officer stationed in Egypt in 1801, was quote a poor Arab, a poor Arab's feast, a meager substitute for a proper meal. Okay, a meager substitute for a proper meal. In the port city of Rosetta, he saw the locals eating watermelons rav uh, ravenously, as if afraid the passerby was going to snatch them away, and watermelon rinds littered the streets. There, the fruit symbolized many of the same qualities as it would in post-emancipation America. Uncleanliness, uh, because eating watermelon is so nasty, it's so messy, I should say. Laziness, because growing watermelons is so easy, and because it's hard to eat watermelon and keep working, it's a fruit you have to sit down and eat. Child childishness because watermelons are sweet, colorful, and devoid of much nutritional value and unwanted uh, public presence because it's hard to eat a watermelon by yourself. So these tropes made their way to America, but the watermelon did not yet have a racial meaning. Americans were just as likely to associate the watermelon with white Kentucky hillbillies or New Hampshire yokels as with black South Carolina slaves. Um, now, this caricature here, this is, uh, so you see the selling of watermelons. Soon after winning their emancipation, many African Americans sold uh, watermelons uh, in order to make a living outside the plantation system. Okay, this is uh, an illustrated uh, illustration by Frank Leslie's uh, illustrated newspaper. This may be surprising given how prominent watermelons were in enslaved uh, African Americans' lives. Many slave owners let their African slaves grow and sell their own watermelons, or even let them take a day off during the summer to eat the first watermelon harvest. Uh, the slave uh, Israel Campbell, the enslaved African named Israel Campbell, would slip a watermelon into the bottom of his cotton basket when he fell short of his daily quota and then retrieve the watermelon at the end of the day and eat it. Israel Campbell taught the trick to another slave who was often whipped for not reaching his quota. And soon it was widespread. When the year's cotton uh, crop fell a few bales short of what the master had figured it seemed it simply remained quote unquote a mystery all right uh but southern whites saw their slaves enjoyment of watermelon as a sign of their own supposed benevolence 
African slaves were usually careful to enjoy watermelon according to the code of behavior established by white people. When an Alabama overseer cut open watermelons for the slaves under his watch, he expected the children to want run to get their slice. One boy named Henry Barnes refused to run, and once he did get his piece, he would run off to the slave quarters to eat out uh, to, to eat it out of white people's sight. His mother would then whip him, he remembered, for being so stubborn. The whites wanted uh, Henry Barnes to play the part of the watermelon craving, juicy dribbling pickaninny. His refusal undermined the tenuous relationship between master and slave. Okay, read the rest of this article here from um, The Atlantic. Theatlantic.com, how watermelons became a racist trope. Okay, before its subversion in Jim Crow era, in the Jim Crow era, the fruit symbolized black self-sufficiency. This is by William R. Black, December 8th, 2014. All right, now there was a um, piece here from NPR Radio. It dealt with... Um, the song played on ice cream trucks. We we call that uh, ice cream truck song unpleasant news for you. It deals with um, the song Turkey in the Straw, which was the melody, melody Turkey in the Straw, which was used for N-word level watermelon, ha, 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 1916 by Harry Brown. This piece right here, you can read this article. I don't have time to get into it, but you read this article here. Recall, recall that ice cream uh, truck song. We have unpleasant news for you. Recall that ice cream truck song. We have unpleasant news for you. Okay. Um, This is from May 11th, 2014. And uh, so they talk about the song and where love of watermelon and all of that. Uh, so check this out as well. OK. Uh, this is from uh, recall that ice cream truck song. We have unpleasant news for you. All right. And then lastly, this piece, uh, so there was a, a good article from New York Times as well. Tracing the origins of Black American New Year's ritual. This piece here from the New York Times. Tracing the origins of a Black American New Year's ritual, families have long embraced the tradition of eating black eyed peas and greens on January 1st, but the inspiration for the ritual crosses cultures and continents. Okay, this is uh, by Kayla Stewart, December 24th, 2021. So you can check out that article. And then uh, read the one from National Geographic also that deals with the uh, 5,000 the 5,000 year secret, the 5,000 year secret history of watermelon, the 5,000 year secret history of watermelon, ancient Hebrew texts and Egyptian tomb paintings reveal the origins of our favorite summertime fruit. Okay. And this is a, a pretty long article uh, here that you could check out as well. And one of the things it talks about in here uh, on page three says the ancient Greek name for the watermelon was the pepon. Okay. Uh, they talk about the uh, pharaonic fruit. People have been eating watermelons for millennia. We know this because archaeologists found watermelon seeds along with the remnants of other fruits at a 5,000 year old settlement, settlement in Libya. 
So 5,000 years ago in Libya, Libya was, was, was black Africa. Okay. This is before Arab invasions of, of Libya. Seeds as well as paintings of watermelons also have been discovered in Egyptian tombs built more than 4,000 years ago, including King Tut's uh, tomb, King, uh, uh, Pharaoh Tut Ankhamen, uh, which was recovered in 1922. One tomb painting in particular stands out. The watermelon depicted uh, in the image is not round like the wild fruit, Instead, it has the now familiar oblong shape, suggesting that it was a cultivated variety. A fair question to ask is why the Egyptians began uh, cultivating wild watermelons in the first place. The fruit was hard and, ap and, and unappetizing. The fruit was hard and unappetizing, tasting either bitter or bland. Yet somebody at some point said, hey, let's grow more of these. Okay, so read the rest of this uh, article here. And then in the, let's see, next page. Uh, um, after 2000 BC, the watermelon's historical trail must be teased out of medical books, travel logs, uh, recipes, and religious texts. By studying and comparing descriptions from several sources, um they they reference uh who is this harry paris who's a horti uh, horticulturalist horticulturalist uh at the agricultural research organization in israel harry paris harry paris was able to deduce the ancient names for the watermelon and track its many uses um writing Writing from about 4,000 BC to 500 AD, writings from about 4, 400 BC to 500 AD, or common era, indicate that watermelon spread from north northeastern Africa to Mediterranean countries. Harry Paris speculates, uh, in addition to trade and bartering, the watermelon's territorial expansion was aided by its unique role as a natural canteen for fresh water on long voyages. The ancient Greek name for the for the watermelon was Pepon, P-E-P-O-N. Physicians, including Hippocrates, who was a child of Imhotep, because Imhotep was the father of medicine, and Hippocrates said he that he studied from the teachings of Imhotep, and um, Dio, uh, Dio, uh, Socrates, Socrates um, praised the, the watermelon's many healing properties. It was prescribed as a diuretic and as a way to treat children with heat stroke uh, by placing the cool, wet rind on their heads. Okay, so read the rest of this piece here from uh, National Geographic, the 5,000-year secret history of the watermelon, the 5,000-year secret history of the watermelon. All right, so hopefully you learned a lot from this broadcast. If you like this type of information, uh, be sure to register for the uh, online history class that I teach. It's uh, This time around, it's a 16-week uh, online history class, Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so when you go to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, and we have the links here in the... Um, the uh, thread of the broadcast we have the links here in the thread of the broadcast uh scroll down the page you'll see the information for our radio show you'll see our cash app paypal information also this is a interview i did with one of my teachers professor james small dealing with the uh movie the woman king so watch that broadcast uh and then uh, we have the download uh my download lectures in digital download format uh as well we have a bundle pack of 15 of my lectures we have the uh, Hapi Presents uh, Black Excellence Awards and the whole event they have going on February 4th. And Professor Jane Small and Dr. L and Professor Jane Small and Professor Jane, uh, Professor Kabahai Watha Kamene will be there and others. 
that's put on by brother Taiki Grant and sister Felicia. Uh, you can get your tickets for that. Click on the link right here. Uh, register here to get tickets for that. And you can also watch the live stream worldwide as well. Uh, if you can't make it in person, that's Saturday, February 4th, 2023, 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, so we have the information for the online classes I teach. It's normally it's on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. We're doing a special session on Sunday, January 15th, 2023, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. This session will be a free session. So click right here. You can register for it for free, but you can register for the entire uh, 16 week online course. Register here. It's on sale $60, regularly $130. Now, this helps us to keep doing the research, keep doing broadcasts like this, uh, cover the expense of running the African History Network. So uh, you can go ahead and register for the entire class right now. As soon as you register the previous sessions, you can go back and watch them. They're archived. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. OK, so next class would be Sunday, January 15th. And then uh, our Tuesday class is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. But we really look at history from 1800 through 1968 and look at history chronologically to see what happened to us, what led up to the uh, Civil War taking place, what happened to us after slavery ended. We look at the Jim Crow era, uh, Reconstruction, uh, Jim Crow era, Great Migration, Civil War, uh, Great Migration, World War, World War One, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. So um, all these sessions, we do them live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, so you can go back and watch these anytime. So a year from now, two years from now, you still have access to the entire course. You can go back and watch it as much as you want. We have a bundle pack right now where you can get these for a limited time only. You can get both these classes for only $100. You can use this information with your children. I would say this, uh, the information is PG-13, okay? So you can visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Information is right there. You can register for both classes. Uh, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, uh, all of that in the class. And if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, uh, email me at uh, ahnshow at... Uh, at the African History Network.com, AHN show at the African History Network.com, because you get a 50% discount on the bundle pack. All right. So that's a, a really good, um, uh, that's a really good offer uh, you can take advantage of. And you never look at history the same way as well. If you like this broadcast here, then I did. If you learned a lot from this, you're going to learn uh, a lot more from uh, the online class. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, be sure to support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, this helps us uh, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, do the research, finance the Sunday night show, pay some of the bills, etc. Okay, so we'll post that information here as well. And uh, you can also advertise with the African History Network. Advertise your African-American-owned business with the African History Network. Um, email us at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Our current promotion is buy one month, get one month free, okay? And we take your 30-second and 60-second commercial. We put it into the rebroadcast of a uh, broadcast like this that we do. Also, it will be an audio podcast format, so we're on nine or ten different audio podcast platforms, FM Player, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, CastBox, et cetera. So uh, when people listen to the uh, audio uh, version of our shows and these broadcasts, they will hear your commercial as well, okay? So email us at ahnshow at at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, or you can just go to our website and click on contact the African History Network, and you can email us through the website. All right, remember, right now is correct, wrong behavior is not over till we win, we're kind of forever.